The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, Who New Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. Hi, everybody. It's Maria from What's Story with Maria. How's it going? We are coming to you live from New York City. This is What's the Story with Maria. My name is Maria. And uh, we want to thank Jim Bell. He's our producer and engineer. We want to thank Leo Rodriguez. He is in Idlewild, California. He is running the ship from there. Jimmy is running the ship on Armed Radio from New Hampshire. And uh, so many great things are happening, as uh, they do every Tuesday. We go live and we do a lot of really fun stuff. So let me just, I'm going to pull up. I really enjoy pulling up the show on both my my show page and my What's the Story with Maria page. Now, let me See, just tell you that if you would like to share the show, we love it. So the way to do that, that if you share the show, that means it runs on your page as well. And um, lots of times our guests do that. But if you're someone that likes to share the show while it's happening, and that way people can actually type in live, then please go ahead and do that. So just at the bottom of the uh, of the little video, you'll see as it's going live, share, and you can share it. If you share public, it goes directly to your page. Oh, my goodness, Leo. Leo Rodriguez is sharing it right now as we speak to our YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is What's the Story with Maria. If you want to watch, and this is all Leo. Leo did all this. I cannot take credit for it. Leo, I love when you do a box within a box within a box. <laughs> uh, I can't take credit for it, but what Leo has done is he's archived every single one of our shows. So tonight I think is, boy, 257 or something like 257. that. 257. Whoa, 257. Now but look, we have all the way down to number one with that guy, that brother from Manetta Mutter. Oh, my God, Chris DePierre, who, by the way, that little rascally rabbit is in Key West. He's having the time of his life down there. Yeah, he, he is. I saw those pictures. Action. <laughs> that was our first show five years ago. Oh, my goodness. As a matter of fact. Hey, your apartment looks the same. My apartment always looks the same. If you know me, I'm a creature of habit. I'm trying to mix that up, though. I've been decluttering, uh, and I'm very proud of myself. I've gotten rid of so much stuff, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to attempt very soon to, I was talking to my super today, we're going to maybe paint the kitchen and get some new Ooh. cabinets in there. He's so great. He's really going to help me out, because I need some new stuff, and new ceilings, and I might, I might, I don't know, even paint the living room. The no. problem is that I have so many things to take down off shelves, put back on. I'm just going to say, if you paint the kitchen, do you know how much cooking you're going to have to do to get that feeling, that homeness I back mean, in? Maybe I shouldn't paint the kitchen. Maybe, maybe what I'll do, I know, because my kitchen, to paint my kitchen, but I would like some new cabinets. I wouldn't mind. some Because the, my cabinets... Well, then you might as well paint. If you're going to take the cabinets off and do that, you might as well I know. Paint. My cabinets are from, like, literally not the 70s. Like, but the don't you think that, like, you know, a kitchen is kind of like the skillet? You know, you just... You season it, and you season it. So when you walk in, it's like, wow, Maria, it's like my grandma's house. You know that what? I, yes, thank you. And I'm going to tell you, I cook in the middle of the night quite often. Like, for instance, <laughs> uh, when I get home from Stonewall... On Mondays, it's usually about 3.30 in the morning, which means there's no parking. There's no mm -hmm. parking at 3.30. Nobody's moving the car. Everybody's <clears throat> So what I usually do is I park at a hydrant because I know there's not going to be any cops ticketing until 7 a.m. And then I come in and I start to cook. So last night I came in and I, I cooked meatballs for a couple of hours. And then a couple hours go by and I look at my clock and I'm like, oh, it's 6 a.m. And then I go out and move my car because that's when everybody's going to work. And it's really different. It, 
people that have never lived in New York, now that I've had the opportunity, right. overnight, working that late, it's not like, oh, my God, it's an overnight shift. It's just another shift in this right. city that runs 24-7. Right. 367,000 million a day, a year. It's just, it, it's just another, I work the overnights in the hotels a lot. And, and I has to work them. Yeah, you know, someone's got to see all that craziness in the middle of the night in New York. Right. And the best parts, though, I would have to say, and I'm sure you've got this, is the quiet of the morning in New York. Yes, maybe there's a truck going or there's something going on, but between 3.45 maybe and 5 o'clock, yes, you absolutely. get a quiet New York City, and it's just beautiful. Mm-hmm. You know what? Thank you for saying that. When I have my motorcycle, which I really miss, and I have to get another one, next spring I'm going to get another motorcycle. For now, you know, we're heading into fall and then winter eventually. But the, I got to say, there is something so beautiful about, I mean, even riding my car home is beautiful because it's so quiet. You get the best pictures. You know, side highway and seeing that across the way with that beautiful sky and the GWB. But, what I used to do sometimes when I had my motorcycle is I would drive through the streets of New York and I would drive through even Times Square in the middle of the night. With it. It's just pin drop quiet. So yeah. everything's still lit. Mm-hmm. And I would pass Lincoln Center. I would pass uh, Grant's Tomb. I would pass all the, the busy areas that were quiet, quiet, quiet in the middle of the night. And it was fantastic. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Yeah, there's you know, something, and all you hear is the sound of the of the engine. I wish that you know <laughs> here in Idlewild, here in Idlewild, I get up in my mornings and I you know I have my coffee just right in the quiet of the still. But I want oh, to look at you! You have a head keep eating cup. Oh uh, yeah, look at you! Look at look Maria at mug. You. Every morning I have I have an espresso. Actually, I have a latte. I have. I also enjoy my. I have cafe Bastello. That is my favorite. Cafe Bustello double shot. That gets me going for the whole day. And I don't need a coffee for the rest of the day. I will have tea because I like black tea. Like tonight I had a little peach black tea. Oh, nice. Yeah. Chuck Streeper gave it to me as a little present. Sometimes um, with the kids I have to have, sometimes it calls for a second cup. Yes. Oh, During yeah. The now, oh, weather girl. Look who's joined us. Our weather girl. That's right. Rena Crignali Berry. Rena. I also use this cup. My Aunt Anna, who's her mom, my Ziana, who's so Oh, good, I love me, Anna. Gave me this cup while I was home, footprints oh. in the sand. And now I, I use this. As a matter of fact, I have tea in here right now. So you can tell your, your mom, Rena, that who is my favorite person on the planet Earth, Ziana. That's so, our weather girl. Weather girl's mom right there. So, yeah. yes, we have cups. We have... Now, this, Leo, was your call. If, this, if there was a stock... If this was a stock, it would have gone I have my old one up, so I don't have Leo said to me many moons ago, we need to get tote bags because they're going to get rid of plastic eventually. I said, mm-hmm. Leo, no, they're not getting rid of plastic. And um, th- we're not going to need tote bags. But he's like, yeah, get them. So I got a handful. Well, little did I know, I should have listened to Leo, that these are, this is what we use now in the city. Go mm-hmm. ahead, keep eating on one side. What's the story with Maria? These are 10. As are the cups. So if you want them, let us know. You can email us at uh, what's the story with Maria at Gmail. Or just if you have my uh, phone number, just text me. Now, John Pandish has joined us. John Hi, John. must get a badge, some kind of a badge. He joins us every week. Hi, sweetheart. How are you? Michael Barberi is watching. Hi, Michael. Hi, Michael. And happy birthday to his beautiful husband, Vincent, who's so sweet. So I know it was Vincent's birthday. Kelly Carr. My next door neighbor for years in Stoneham, Massachusetts. We're all grown up now, though, Kelly, and we're on our own. But she was my next door neighbor for many years. Her parents still live there. I saw your brother, Ryan, last week. Um, so cute. He's gigantic. He's like, I call him Jeremiah Johnson. But when he was little, my mom used to babysit him. Oh. So I still remember him in my mind. Paul uh, Paul Craigie is watching us. That's Gene Craig. Hi, Paul. Good to see you. Uh, so we have Rena Queen. That's why I like to watch both screens because sometimes it comes up on what's the story. Sometimes it comes up on uh, my other one. And 
oh my god, our piece de resistance are nothing but the dun 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 are nothing but the are nothing but the apron. There it is. Our blue apron is twenty five. It flies off the shelves. I just had to order a bunch more. That is our biggest seller. And August is coming. That inspired our calendar, our nothing but the apron calendar, which was fifteen. But now it's July. So if you still wanted one, I think I have a few left. I would have to sell it for ten. You want oh, July? July. Look who's look who's wearing nothing but the apron in July. Our friend Ed Kutu with his mug, with his mug. Mary Majo has joined us too. Paul Craigie, Ed Kutu is from Stoneham. He and I were went to high school together. He was Tebya. I was Golda. Do you love me? Do I what? Yes. And sunset. So there's July. Mr. July. Now you are Mr. August. There's a little bit. There's a little peak. So I there's, believe... There's a little Janet Jackson uh, slip going on there. So oh, yeah. yeah right there's, here. there's definitely a wardrobe mm-hmm. malfunction. I didn't have Justin Timberlake to help me, unfortunately. But. I know, but it would have been nice. would have been nice. Now you um, will be our Mr. August, and we will launch that that month next, next week, because this yep. is the last month of July. I mean, last week of July. Meanwhile, well, 2023 is filled up, I believe. Aren't we all the way? We're almost filled up because people, once they saw this apron, they want to be in our 2023 ap- apron. And I got to say, we got a lot of response. People came to us. Can I be in the calendar? I was like, sure. I'm A lot of couples this coming time. A lot of couples. I'm going to say this for the speaker in the green room. A lot of couples this time right. around. Uh-huh. Are in nothing but the apron. They have volunteered. <laughs> Photograph themselves with nothing. So that's that's what it is. If you would like to be in our calendar for 2023, there's a few slots left. Please let us know. You take your a picture of yourself with nothing but the apron on, and uh, Leo has to comb through all the pictures. So painstaking. I know. Oh, I, I know. It. I feel really bad, and I appreciate <sighs> the work it. I do for this. Leo. So Leo goes through all that, and then eventually we choose our 12 months. If you have a month you really want, like I know the Fit Foley's, Carrie Ann Foley and David Foley are doing September because it's their anniversary month. Aww. I know, how cute no, is that, What a way to celebrate. I know, how cute That's is That's awesome. And uh, uh, also Mrs. Feliciano, Elaine Feliciano, Mr. November's wife, is going to be Miss January because that's her birthday month. She it was born on New Year's Day. She's baby wow. New Year's official, yeah. So, okay. Um, now, let me see. Oh, my goodness. We have to get rolling here. Well, so, Maria, remember you mentioned, we mentioned scary nuns? Yes. Uh, I wanted to show you the scariest nun that I've encountered. I know. The nuns were scary. We both went to Catholic school, me and Leo, yeah. so we understand the scary nuns. I, I think we were talking about what, guns for nuns, and so we thought this nun, this oh nun, my might, God. oh my goodness, it's scary. He is so scary. But there's love there, apparently. There's blessings for that nun. It's Sister real. Leo Ignatius. See, Sister Leo Ignatius, okay. she is, I wouldn't mess with her, although there is a softness to her. I think a little bit. I think that's stuff. why she had the heavenly lights, unless that was the fiery the heaven, Was that the heavenly light? I hope so. Yeah. Otherwise, she's burning. All right, she's burning up. She's burning <laughs> up, burning up. Okay, so tonight, speaking of couples, as Leo was implying before, you know, I, funny, I used to book the shows way ahead of time, like four weeks ahead. And lately, I've just been going with my instinct and saying, let's see where I'm because the world is changing overnight, so sometimes I end up going in a political direction. But this morning I said to myself, I don't feel like talking about politics. I'm so sick of hearing it. Not that we shouldn't talk about it, and we will at the end of the show. We will promote our voting, which we do every week. But I really needed to go back to the original mission of the show, which was the arts. You know, we this show is about uh, the reality of living, thriving, and surviving as a creative person. And all that that means, and I was flipping through Facebook, having my delicious Cafe Vistello, and I came upon Emily DeNova's Facebook page, and I see that she is constantly working. She and Greg Joffe are constantly working and creating. They, they, you talk about two people that create their own work, that don't sit around 
they create their own work. This is the latest thing. That yeah, this is a on. transit, I believe it is. They do film, so they do stage, they do. Who are you? What makes someone who they are? Identity is about perception, right? Are we always trying to figure that out? So, uh, who are you? That's their latest work. It's called Transit. I am so excited. Are we ready to bring them on, Leo? I believe so. If they haven't gotten everything out of the refrigerator and drank it ready in the green room. <laughs> and, and Greg Choppy, yay! What's going on, guys? How are you guys? How are you? I love your background. Look at how cool that is. You really framed it. Oh, uh, yeah. We, uh, we went well, all out. You, you're kind of good at that. We passed right? around with the lighting for a while. We think we got it right. <laughs> yeah, no, lighting is very important. You did get it right. Looks great. <laughs> May I just say that I wanted to have you guys on for well. so long. So I'm sorry it took this long. Uh, it's just that sometimes, you know, like things come up, people are doing shows, and I. I want to do, you know, I want to promote their shows closer to the time. And Emily, I was texting with you this morning, and I was going to go in a political direction today, but I was just like, I don't. That's why it was the last minute, and you were so nice to say yes, and then Greg was on board. So thank you both. Thank you um, for having, having us. Sweet. Absolutely. Oh, I'm, I'm thrilled. First of all, you're two of the nicest people ever. <laughs> like, you're just sweet, sweet, sweet people. So that I love. And I applaud that always. Um, now, let's because every let's let everybody know what the story is. You know, because what's the story with Maria? You you two met in Tony and Tina's, or you knew each other before Tony and Tina's? We met at the audition. Oh my god! Tony and Tina's wedding. Um, <laughs> it was it was actually one of the callback. callback, and I was going in for Dominic, and she was going in for Donna. And we didn't know each other. And Tony Loria put us in the room together. And actually, he took a picture the first day we ever met uh, because he thought we made a cute couple for the show and wanted to send it to his producer. So that was how we literally met. <laughs> and he thought I was totally crazy. I was, you know, talking to everyone like, oh, and he was in like super serious actor mode. And um, <laughs> this is cool. <laughs> I love it. But you know what? That makes a lot of sense. That's kind of a little bit of Donna and Dominic anyway. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. <laughs> you know, I know the show. I was in the show for many years, way before you two. So I didn't get the uh, the privilege of working with you, which I wish I had. But, you know, that's the way the show goes. It just goes on. And so many amazing actors have come out of that show. So you met in that show and then you played a couple in the show. Mm hmm. And um, and then we, you know, as it happens in Tony and Tina's world, we just got together. Um, and then, you know, once we kind of started to get to know more about each other, what we were into, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, we realized that we both, you know, had such a severe love for the arts and um, writing, directing, producing, and of course, acting. So we decided to start our own production company. <laughs> yeah, it was, that was right around the time uh, that the Times Square revival closed. Okay. Uh, and then after that, right after that, we were kind of uh, promoted to uh, one of the Tony and Tinas. So we've been we've been playing Tony and Tina for I don't know. It seems like about seven years. Seven ish. Six I think. seven years yeah. now, and. Um, and that's when we also decided, oh, why not create our own little production company there? <laughs> okay, now you both, do you still do it on tour? You still go, okay, so when they do tours, which they do quite often, they do uh, sometimes Vegas, Chicago. I, I've seen, because I know Susie Campanero goes out on a lot of those. She's yeah. my best buddy in the world. So that's kind of how I connected to both of you, through Susie. Right. Originally, and then and then I got to know you, and I I think you're wonderful. So I claim you as my friends now. So, <laughs> um, and it's a weird, small, sort of strange world because you know two of our really good friends by happenstance who used to come into the, or who do still come into the duplex, Johan and Jonah, and by chance yeah. we all just happen to know each other, and they're I like, I love you. 
So yeah. one of them. <laughs> yeah. One of the sweetest, these two brothers, they're twins, I believe, right? Yeah, they are, yeah. Mm-hmm. And they are so lovely and they always bring up big crowd and they're just great. They're two of my favorite customers. How weird is that? I and know, they, small world. Yeah, small world. And then uh, Emily Joe Gulla, who's a good friend of mine, also you were uh, amazing in his play. Thank you. <laughs> amazing. I loved it. I laughed so much. It was really great. Now, um, so I'm. Uh, let me just out. Sometimes people join us, and I like to shout them out. Mary Majo's joined us. Sandra Carr, who's my next door neighbor that I grew up there. She's wonderful. Mario Davila from Brandy's Piano Bar, my favorite place I've ever worked, is also joined us now. You guys don't just act, which you're great at that, but you also write produce direct you have your own production company very 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 ambitious very impressive Uh, how how did that start and and uh how hard is that to to maintain and keep going with that that must be challenging well i think i think we created the production company as a way to showcase ourselves in ways that we were not being showcased right Mm. so look at the type of roles we tend to land. Uh, They're all similar, right? Like if you look at my resume, you'll probably see like making of the mob or Godfather of Harlem and the Irishman. You know, it's like, so it's like the same type of roles. Tony and Tina can fit in there too. We both felt like, uh, you know, there were other sides and facets to us uh, that that we wanted to show uh, the world. So we kind of created uh, the small production company as a way to do so. And then I think it started growing li- little by little. And being your own bosses is not bad in that sense because we don't have necessarily deadlines per se. So there's no one to yell at us if we don't uh, meet our quota. We yell quota. at ourselves enough. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> but we try to produce one film and one short uh, theatrical piece a year. With Since COVID, that's been harder, especially with the theatrical piece. Uh, but that's the goal. But we did do a teleplay during the pandemic. I was going to say, now, a lot of people went the route of virtual, which I actually loved I, because I felt that, that I was still connected to my friends that were creative. And I, I was so happy to support. And I, I was so grateful to have something to watch that was happening in real time. So what what did you folks do in uh, in COVID that... That right there, that, that was, was on the screen. That was one of them. Greg also directed um, a piece. A Zoom uh, play. And yeah. I did a couple uh, other Zoom pieces as well as an actor. But this one we produced together. Um, it is a story that is, uh, you know, as classic New York as, as it gets. It's about a, um, a streetwise young woman who falls in with this group of wise guys who kind of protect her and take care of her. I was very uh, fortunate to work with Bobby Finero, who... I love dearly. He's a great friend, a great actor, and I've worked with him before on a few projects. Uh, it was written by Frank Petrelli, who is also an amazing human being. The whole cast was great. Um, they're a great group of guys, and um, it was definitely filled those, you know, uh, days where we were just like, "Oh my God, what are we doing?" Um, right. and, and it was different, you know, to to, to do a teleplay. Um, we had we we kind of. Ed- Frank edited it. He added um, like sound effects. We really kind of created this unique thing um, that I had never previously experienced, and um, it, it was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, um, you know, especially like union rules and stuff were changing with you know COVID. What's theater? What's film? What's in between? Yeah, wow. We experienced that on a film set too. We actually um, produced a film that we didn't write uh two summers ago now right Mm -hmm. and that was like at the height of things and dealing with all of the you know covid rules with the union and making sure people stayed safe um Mm -hmm. right that film that was a lot but that's what's been nice is in more recent years people have been starting to reach out to us saying you know we want to work with you on this project we want to you know have you produce or direct assistant direct and we kind of come as a a package deal in a lot of the case yeah but i love that you know what well, uh, I, I loved your website. I went to it. And one of the things I really loved about it is it's so welcoming. Like what, your, your mission statement is kind of, it's just very welcoming. Like what I got from it without quoting it directly, because I want people to go to G and E productions.com. Right. Is that the website? Yes. That is it. <laughs> is it G and E? Okay. So please, I urge you, Leo will put it up there. 
to go there yourself and read everything because it's so much great stuff to read and so many different pieces that you worked on and uh i love that that just the mission is so like you know you're you're there to work you you want to help other actors work like we're open to your script what i got from it is like just send us your work like we'll look at it we promise we'll look at it and i thought that was great and i was fascinated with that particular the museum piece the the museum of lost things yeah. wow that was beautiful yeah it's a it's a really interesting piece so um i'm also a big fan of of keeping uh the resources in my life so when i was a uh, in college i had an english professor his name was dennis paul and uh he recently at that time started writing you know he taught literature uh, mm. he started writing his own pieces and over the years i kept in contact and he was watching me as an actor and i was keeping in contact as, and reading his works and he had this one piece called museum of lost things and i said this needs to be a movie you know and um so we sat down we interviewed all these directors uh but we kind of felt like none of them really got the thing like because it's a very niche thing it's kind of mm -hmm. a little weird you know it's very like quirky quirky um kind of wes anderson meets woody uh, allen in a certain type of humor in a certain type of way and eventually i just said I i'll i'll do it let me direct the thing i know what you're trying to do and trying to say and i have a vision for it so that actually mm -hmm. ended up being the first film i ever directed wow i i love that i mean i uh i just thought it was really cool and the the quality of the uh, of the shots the quality of the film work the cinematography is really high you know it's like it's high end it's not this is not some like duct tape piece together you know amateurish project this is really really good stuff and yeah we we partnered with uh, the major productions which is a great production company originally out of long island and um yeah the premise is really interesting it's about a, a man who walks into a museum he's never noticed before and he slowly starts to realize that all the items on display are things that he has lost in his life right mm -hmm. and as he keeps going in the museum it goes from the more literal to the more figurative so it starts off where there's a room of lost umbrellas and things like that he's like this is weird you know these umbrellas kind of look uh you know like you know similar to ones i've had and then as it keeps going, you know, there's a room of lost friends and a room of lost love where he encounters yeah. things of that nature. So it was a great premise. It actually won Best Story at the Long Island International Film Expo, and it won Best Supporting Actor in uh, the Madrid International Film Festival, and it got a couple of mentionable honors uh, elsewhere. So that was actually our, that film actually catapulted Genie Productions into the public. That was the first thing we presented with our new company. Wow, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. And you know, I always had this fantasy in my brain that when we die, we 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 get to see our loved ones, of course, but then eventually you get your own room. Mm. I, I always thought of that, that, and I always felt like everything that you had lost you would, would be in that room. So it, when I saw this, I was like, oh my God, that's so I'm amazing. I'm yeah. so uh, <laughs> I feel identified with it, like you know, like lost baseball gloves when you were a kid, or yeah. you, you know, dogs that like I had a dog that that I mean I thought she ran away, but then found out years later she was stolen. You know, like things like that, like all these things. And when I saw that, I was really touched by it. You know, now Emily, you're working on a new piece now. I think do, are you doing a horror film? Uh, I shot a. Um a the first part like a prologue for uh, a horror film that is like looking there they needed to uh give it to their investors so mm -hmm. it was kind of like a quick uh weekend shoot which was a lot of fun um i'm hoping to hear soon hopefully that goes into production um yeah. we'll have a couple other things going on tell um, me tell me sorry Tell me all about it. Oh. I'll get the stuff you're working on. <laughs> so actually, um, a novel that I wrote is being published, um, which is really exciting. That's um, so exciting. <laughs> God. Um, so it's a piece that I wrote. It's a feminist um, sort of period piece. It takes um, this kind of idea of like a romantic historical setting that you would see in kind of any, you know, um, these old historical romance novels but then it has this very uh 
perfect gothic twist and it kind of plays with the idea that like this vampire idea that vampires are these seductive, you know, wonderful creatures, that they are actually a metaphor for narcissism and narcissists. And wow, it's great for you. So um, it's kind of, I'm trying to, you know, make sure that it's it's uh, marketed properly because I don't want to, you know, break people's hearts too much. Um, but it's a really exciting project and it's something that I wrote as I was working through therapy and my own relationships with narcissists throughout my past. And so it's a very important piece to me. It's a very important piece, I think, for women um, to read. I recently actually, last year, wrote a, um, a blog article about our romanticizing of the bad boy trope in film. Mm, and I love that. That's great. And yeah, and how, you know, do we really need this trope anymore? What does it mean? Where does it stem from? Why is it this perpetuating thing throughout society that these... these and when you write these blogs, where do you post them? On our website. <laughs> and so, that's what I was going to ask you. So g you know, Productions you has a blog. Uh, it's called g and &E Emotion. It can be found right on the website. Wow. Uh, I publish monthly articles. So usually Emily and I contribute wow. once a year each and then the other 10 months are guest articles um all mediums of art acting directing writing singing so i think we just had one go up yesterday uh, voice, I think, voiceover work. uh based on on voiceover so it's a really interesting blog that you can you can check out we're always putting out new stuff yeah, yeah we really that's really cool yeah. So but you should also tell everyone the name of your novel so that they can oh, they can check it out. <laughs> yeah, it's um, I'll obviously post about it once it goes up. I'm looking for a Halloween ish time of about October first. It should be going live. It's called Veil of Seduction. Veil um, of Seduction. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. we'll definitely look for that. And as it gets closer to, if if you get anything like a, any kind of a digital flyer or anything, just send it our way, and I will post it on my show page for sure. Thank you. Cool. <laughs> oh, yeah, my pleasure. So, um, you know, my next question is, I mean, you have so much good stuff happening. My next question is, which I think um, people always wonder, like when people are in a romantic relationship, but they also do the same thing for a living. I always find that, like, to me, it always sounds wonderful. But I know some times you watch it and it's it's not so good because people start to compete. Or, but you two don't seem to have that at all. You're very supportive of each other, and it's just kind of this really nice ebb and flow, which then creates like a double, a double strength. That's what I get from it. Does that? How do you how do you deal with that? I think there's such a level of love that we both share for the craft, and a level of trust that we have cultivated over the years that it's never really about us. It's always mm. about the greater thing hmm. um yeah i think i think uh, in general the the philosophy is that we always want to boost artists up right whether that's us or the people we are working with or anyone we know right we don't view it as a competition right because once like if two actors get into a scene and they start to be competitive it usually doesn't uh, end up very well mm -hmm. um so right. really it's about uh you know switching off of who should take the lead of what project we wish to prioritize, have it feel fair and and make us feel happy with what we're doing, yeah. uh, and to also you know boost everyone up, especially ourselves. And, <laughs> and, and we're both like huge collaborators. Like collaboration is super important to us. And as you said, you yeah, know, I agree. And and everything like we just love to work with people. Like we love new ideas. We never think that we have the best ideas. Like we always are open to something being greater or better. Um, and you know, Greg's philosophy that I really admire over the years has been that he will take the time to work with someone who maybe isn't necessarily right there when we start, but he knows and he's confident in himself as a director or whatever that he can get them to where they need to be. He will choose to work with someone like that over someone who might come in and nail everything, but they're going to be a toxic, you know, so, personality that's going to destroy the rest of the cast or going to cause problems. He will go beyond that to say, no, I'd rather work with someone who might need a little bit more work, but you know what? We're going to have a conducive environment. It's going to be cohesive. We're going to have good energy. Like, we don't like to work in that vein. We try to keep as much negativity as we possibly can out of our lives and our art. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. And I couldn't agree with you more. 
because you, you know you use the word toxic and that's exactly what happens it poisons everything yep. you know and i i love like i always think you know when i go into any project i always like say like a little prayer or a little meditation and i say i mean whatever you believe in but my my prayer is always god make me a a channel of your work and not my ego you know like your message and not my ego because i feel like if we can just be vessels for whatever that higher power is whether it's god whether it's our creativity whether it's the universe if you just are open to channeling that versus going in with your ego and i'm going to be it, it's so much more beautiful and authentic you know so, it's all about love at the end of the day Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. You know, the, one of the original Tinas, not the, the very original, but like when I when I was in the show from 91 to 98, her name was Sharon, is Sharon Angela. She's amazing. And she was in a, uh, she was in The Sopranos. She played Rosalie at Prelate. And she's a great friend of mine. And I love her. And I, I, I loved her work always. But she always would say that to me. It's about the work, Maria. It's not about anything else. Like whatever you do. Because I really admired her, and I would always, we would always talk art, you know. And she would always say, "It's about the work," and you know, that's kind of like what you, what you two are doing. That's exactly what I see. It's about the work, you know. Yeah. You don't get bigger than it. You let it just. It's kind of like what I'm seeing is you let it have your own, have its own life. Right. Yeah. Usually, it, sometimes it's steering the ship. You know, <laughs> it's, it's what it wants to be. You are just kind of there to make sure it comes to fruition. Yeah. Leo, can you join this conversation for, uh, I want to bring Leo in because Leo, is, is being, he's being very humble and he's back there doing all the tech stuff. But Leo is also, um, he's a great actor. He's a writer himself. He wrote this a beautiful musical a few years ago that was in the, uh, um, uh, International Leo. Festival, uh, and, Fringe right. Festival. Yeah. And, um, you, you know, so, uh, so it's, we always talk about this and Leo's an amazing actor. So we always talk about this, you know, like choosing, do you, because I know you're fascinated by this conversation. That's why I was like, because I know Leo really well. I'm like, there's no reason you have to stay back. So Leo, do you want to throw anything in here or ask any questions or? No, it's real. I, I kept thinking about the uh, documentary on, I think it's HBO, uh, that follows Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward's um, relationship and career throughout. And it was... Um, something that his daughter had asked Ethan Hawke to direct. And uh, it just, it, the way you're talking, and um, also said All About Love, by the way, that's one of the songs in the show. That's why I hashtagged it. I saw, um, that, I saw that sneaky snake, that's why I called you in. <laughs> uh, um, uh, well, he said it, it so it's yeah. All About Love. But I just thought about the work that they did, and, and I think Paul Newman had written it and then burned all the tapes. He burned everything. Luckily, really? Yeah, there were the transcripts were left. So Ethan Hawke had a bunch of his friend actors read the voices of those actors at the time that Paul Newman had interviewed about them. So wow. it just made me think about you guys. So keep it going so we can get your documentary on HBO. Yeah, right. And those are major names you and me in the same sentence with. But uh, yeah. it all starts somewhere, though, right? Yeah, we appreciate your confidence. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, one of the uh, for, I want to take a minute to uh, we had some new people that have joined us. Suzanne Murray, Sergeant Sue, my friend, many years, NYPD. Now she's in Florida. Sergeant Sue uh, is watching the show. Elena Ponte Feliciano. Elaine, we were talking about you because we were talking about our calendar, and you are going to be Miss January. We're very excited about that. Peter Feliciano, her husband, is going to have some competition. I'll tell you right now. Well, we still have to get through November 1st anyway. So. <laughs> yes, I know. He is Mr. November. Miss uh, Meg Peg Gallagher, my friend from high school, is watching. She's a wonderful person in the arts as well. So, um, so what Leah was talking about, jo- um, Joanne Woodward and and Paul Newman, they are a perfect example of what we were just talking about. Couples that I always respected because it they worked so beautifully together and complemented each other. But they never they were both amazing actors, but they didn't compete. I never felt that. And then other times you see couples and you're like, oh, my God, this is going to end disastrously. It's not going to be good. You know, it's, <coughs> excuse me. I actually look at it as the opposite a lot now that, you know, I'm here. But, you know, in the past it was always like people who weren't in the industry that you dated, like almost harder because they couldn't understand like 
what you're doing. Like, you're going to go do that. Like, what? Like, Why would you do that? Right. Why do you want to do that? Right. They don't yeah, get right. that. So, it is a lifestyle. It's, it's, it's a very it's, different type of life. It's a total... To be an artist is... Uh, you know, it's a lifetime commitment. I don't care what anybody says. And, and you know, people don't, I mean, this is, I'm speaking for myself. People don't always understand it's never about the money. If it becomes about the money, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Like, you will make money. You, you will finance your art doing other things. You know, like I've always said that. Like, even to my, my young, my students and stuff, I always say, listen, find something you can do that will finance your art so you can do your art. Don't go into... The arts thinking, oh, I'm going to make uh, millions of dollars and I'm going to be, forget that. It's not going to work. You, you know how many overnight shifts I had to do in order. There was a time in New York when I was working at one hotel job overnight. I started a catering assistant job during the daytime right. when I was producing, acting, directing my show. And yeah. so I would sleep an hour on the train somewhere I would land up and then I'd end up at Midtown for rehearsal from six to nine, sleep another fifth and then go back to the overnight and then just a vicious cycle but i was so thin oh my god <laughs> and you're so, so happy you're so like happy you're i was so yeah you love yeah people don't always understand that you know no, I, I think that you know the cliche of the painter who says you know if, if i wasn't a famous painter I'd, I'd literally be on the streets below painting in the street i don't think people actually believe that when when they say that but the painter is being honest uh -huh. it, it is very it is the absolute truth that if if this level of success wasn't reached, I would be doing the same exact thing in poverty. <laughs> I, I tell you guys, today we did a reading of Aesop's Fables for the kids' nap time. We pulled out 15, and I said, I'm the narrator. Yeah, and so that was, I was like, oh, a script, a script in my hand. It was, and you know, all five of the teachers, we all read while the kids laid there, but it was just like, I'm still doing it. I'm still storytelling. Yeah. 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 And over the years, I also feel like what I defined as success has morphed and changed and shifted and for the better. That's And that's not, people like to think that that's because you haven't made it, so then you're going to shift your definition. But it's actually quite the opposite. It's, it's, it's what maybe you thought at one point isn't exactly what you uh, realized years later. So I think that's a, a good thing for everyone to kind of always examine what they think success looks like and means for them yeah i totally agree i couldn't agree more and you know it's funny because like i'm predominantly a singer i do a lot of different things but predominantly i would put myself in the singer songwriter category and i you know i work in uh, three different bars and i i get to sing and i love it right as hard as it is the other stuff i do but you know what's funny you know what i want to do on my days off i want to sing <laughs> people don't always understand that it's like what yeah. I'm, I love to like I love to get together with Lynn Portis you know we write a lot of stuff together and I like my favorite thing is when we write something and we go to the studio and record it right yeah you know and sometimes people will be like Jesus Christ like you're it's your day off I'm like yeah and that's what I want to do that's how much yeah. I love what I do I know so, like, I get that what you were saying about the the painter you know yeah it's the spirit I, part of us it's the it's it's the part of the spirit that we get to express that's part of our soul for music, paint, writing, whatever it is, we artists is put there to enlighten, hopefully, and to express. And singing, singing hits all the nerves, right? Doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, everyone. So Yeah, I think they call it an outlet for a reason, right? The creative outlet, right? It's right. We need a release of some sort because if we don't have that release and that gets bottled up and you're a creative... Oh, it's a destruction of the soul, of the spirit, of whatever whatever it is. Absolutely, 100%. I could not agree more. During, You know when I really realized that was during COVID? And I think most of us did. Because I, I, I was freaking out. I didn't know what to do with myself. And I realized that what I did had actually saved my life. Because I, I had so much like electricity going through me, and I didn't know what to do with it. So, like, I was even making little videos just playing the guitar and singing because I couldn't stand not doing it. Yeah. And I didn't know what else to do. And sometimes I would be doing it at, like, 3 in the morning, but I realized, well, that's what I would be doing at 3 in the morning if I was working in the club. Right. So that's my time, and I'm wide awake, and I need to connect creatively with, with somebody out there. And it was, it was one of the, the silver linings of COVID that I 
discovered that about not just myself but my fellow creatives because they would put stuff where they were writing a lot i started a women's writers group and it was all women from all over the country that i knew as friends at some point we would meet every wednesday and we would exchange things that we had written it was amazing that's great well the we we did uh spend the majority of lockdown writing and that book that was mentioned earlier that Emily is going to get published was written during the times of COVID. No, it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was started. No, that was my other novel. No, that was you wrote two novels during He's the got massive. All wrong. During the massive. <laughs> Number. Oh yeah, there are a couple. Very proud of you, Emily. That's what I'm getting. I'm getting that he's so, so proud I'm of you. Proud, yes, and goes right out the window. <laughs> now, I, I do want to talk quickly. Talk about. Um, we're gonna. We'll take a minute. In, in a minute, uh, we're gonna just. I want to talk about a friend of ours who's doing a show, and I want to promote his show. But um, you, you talked about writers. So how do so writers will send you pieces, or they'll get a hold of you, and you like short. Like I saw one of them was based on a short story that Emily wrote, mm. but then you turned it into a screenplay. And so will people send you short stories? Do they send you plays? How does that work? Um, yeah, it really depends. I mean, we get kind of a plethora of everything. Um, we, like we said, we like to produce our own stuff. Uh, I like to write prose more so than screenplays. Uh, mm. great, kind of the screenplay master. So I'm like, here. <laughs> make it so it works on film um <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> cool um but yeah we get short stories sometimes we get scripts that are that are already completed and people are just like we think that you'd be great to direct this or produce this or we just want hands on board that we know we can trust with this project we think it would be you know a good fit so it's it's all sorts and like we said you know we we welcome everyone so it's kind of like yeah send us send us anything you got even if you're not a writer if you're a makeup artist or a dp or you're just anyone looking to make art we're open to seeing what you know you can yeah. and the newest of those actually we collaborated with our mutual friend susan campanero yeah oh she's my best friend i know she board is my two best friends yeah yeah. You guys also have not mentioned your other connection, which I've been waiting. The very prolific gay playwright for this time, though, it's the playwright, Joe Gullah. Well, oh, yeah. Who's amazing. It's oh, so God. funny you bring up Joe because I was doing what you were doing. I was working a corporate job, like a lunatic, from like 8 a.m. till like 5.30, and then going to rehearsals. I got cast in Joe, Joe's show, Gay Porn Mafia. This yeah. is in 2018. And I was doing rehearsals and then going out and, you know, doing the whole thing. And that's when I met Joe. And then we kept in touch because we had such a great time working together. And then he met Susan. And then I was like, well, I know Susan. And then How you know, ended up doing Real Wood. So it's, again, one of those strange, weird things where we all um, connected. But Joe is fabulous. He is like one of the people that anything I read that he writes, I'm like, I want in. I want to be in it. I want to read it. I want to be a part of it. He is an absolutely lovely, wonderful human being. Well, yeah, I saw him last night. He was at Stonewall last night for hours and hours. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And we talk. And we, I love Joe. Joe's amazing. And so smart. And he doesn't take enough credit for his how brilliant he is. But he's so funny. Speaking of brilliant, Andy Prasky has joined us. Andy... I want you to, you would love Andy Presky. He also works in film and um, documentaries. He does a lot of commercials. And uh, But Andy, you need to go back and watch this because you would love these two and they would love you. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm predicting a connection here. Andy Presky, meet Greg Shafi. Is it, do I pronounce it correctly, Shafi? Yep. Okay, that's how I would say it. That's how it's written, but you know, everybody's got their thing. And Emily DeNova and Annette Zito. I'm late, but better late than never. Yes, that's right, Zitos. And they, Annette Zito has her own cooking show. Um, she's amazing. Kitchenette. Kitchenette, right? And she's an amazing chef and great presenter. She is a powerhouse woman right now. Yeah, she is taking she's control amazing. of her. her she's yes. watch out for her. You would all get along great. Now, um, so Andy, please promise me you'll go back and watch because I think that that you would all really benefit from from connecting actually now that andy's uh, andy's online i want to say i had a phone conversation with andy yesterday andy uh, you seem great may i just take a moment to say leo is blushing his cheeks are getting yeah, red. I, I, I am because yes, the one here. thing the one thing of all of our friends that we know about we were talking about maria 
And I said, being at Maria's birthday party was like being in a room full of love. And Andy, it, he upped me. He said, you know, Maria is like a cruise ship with all <laughs> these people. And she's looking at uh, this, just like this love boat. Uh-huh. This, essentially, I, I may have misquoted a little bit, but it was all about. You, you know, that's it's why so I, funny I, that you say that about the cruise thing. ship when... Uh, when I was younger, I used to think if I hit the lottery, that's one of the first things I'd do. I would charter a giant cruise ship and just put oh. all my friends and family on it. How much fun would that be? We yeah. would never, we would never set anchor. Yeah, I no, never I never for it again. No. <laughs> no. How much fun would that be? Okay, I want to take a minute because I do want to promote our friend Don Giovanni uh, is doing a show, uh, Guys and Dolls, in Sharon, Connecticut. It opens, uh, Leah, when does it open? The t- it opens, drum roll please, July 29th to July. August 14th. Okay, so today's the 26th, so in three days, and it plays for two weeks, and it's a uh, tap dancing, very tap dance heavy um, version of Guys and Dolls, which I happen to love Guys and Dolls. I think it's such a fun musical. So he really emphasized that, and I was kind of hoping to zoom him in quickly but they're in a tech and they're not going to be done so i did want to give a shout out to our friend dom giovanni we put it up there if you're in connecticut and you're looking actually eddie kutu who's our friend that usually pops on but he's in july it uh works at blade salon manages blade salon so maybe that's close and you and your girls from your salon can go and check out dom giovanni so i did want to give a plug for that um so let me see we have like eight minutes left to our show it always flies by it always flies by um so i was gonna say like sometimes because you know i love i love writing i think writing is such an amazing thing you know um even as a kid did you because i as a kid i wrote 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 wrote. it was my escape it was my way of like not killing somebody like i had so much rage even as a kid that i didn't know what to do with but i always had a diary i always had a diary i was always scribbling Leo, were you that kind of kid? Uh, yeah, I was inspired by, uh, uh, there's a book, Harriet the Spy. I used to carry my little book like Harriet the Spy around. Yeah. Just I observations and notes. So many notebooks that I have here that have like songs and script beginnings and things like that still that I've collected that haven't made it to the, you know, to the yeah, ballroom yet. I love that. Um, and how about you two? Did you, as kids, write as well? Or was that later in life? Well, well, I'll start. Yeah, I mean, I still have notebooks everywhere. Like, I half baked ideas, literally a folder like this of half baked ideas. I literally mm-hmm. think of them as that. Um, but yeah, I've always was. I had a lot of rage too. I'm, my rage has only grown, so I just have more and more notebooks. Great. Excellent. <laughs> Great. But we're Italian. I think that goes with it. Right. That goes with it. Yeah. I, I definitely was a writer before I was an actor or anything else from a, as long as I could remember being a writer was a thing I wanted to be right when I even even when I got to college I majored in English education because I just knew I wanted to write but I didn't know what I could do with just an English degree so I just went the English education route but like I, I remember having small stories that I used to put together when I was a kid and definitely writing was was the thing yeah yeah I, it was just great I love kids that and I always, you know, as a teacher, I always notice that kid that's got the notebook that's always like, you know, and I, I love that. It's such a great outlet. You know, if, if you have kids, if you, uh, it, 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 you know, if you teach kids, I always try to get my kids to like, you know, with Suze, because I also teach with Susie uh, as well. We teach at the at the LGBT center. And but sometimes like if there's nobody's talking or anything, you know, we try to get them to like communicate. Susie will just say give out little pieces of paper and she'll just have people write little thoughts on the paper and then we put them in a pile and we pull them out and we compile we'll put them together we line them in no particular order and it's just amazing you know what comes out of that or we'll use them in something or artwork or something because and then all of a sudden they start to open up because they realize oh my thoughts are important you know and i always loved the teachers that that understood my angst by saying you want to show me what you like uh, you know you don't have to but i'd love to see what you wrote and they they would pull me aside and be like that's really good or that's beautiful or 
or they have questions, you know, like I loved that somebody took the time to notice that I was writing, you know? So, and Leo, you work with kids. So what do you, what do you find about that? Do you, I, I like giving them a piece of paper or a new notebook and go. There's yeah. a lot of I, I, uh, working, especially with the younger groups this time around. There's a lot of, you know, do this craft this way and make it look like this. And I'm like, you want to use different color? You want to do it a different way? Mm -hmm. As long as you're doing something and putting something out there. If you're, or we're doing Aesop's Fables. If their lion has pink hair and blue whiskers, hey. But as long as they know it's a lion and they want to be creative, that you know, may turn into a bedspread later on in life or a quilt. Yeah, really great. And and you know, um, I mean, when I, I'm from a different generation, so we didn't have uh, we had television, of course, but it was very limited. You know, we didn't watch a lot of TV. We we did a certain <laughs> we had our shows, but you know, we really it was more about imagination. We were always building forts and riding our bikes like i remember like riding my bike for miles on end just and i don't my parents never even asked me where the hell i was i mean <laughs> they were working but i just would ride and ride and ride and i would like my imagination would run wild about the places yeah. that i was going or where i was and M maria the other day we had nothing really planned it was a couple of weeks ago for the day i had so many empty boxes and a lot of boys i took out the empty boxes and that's all i had to do Oh, give me this one, and they they had everything. I mean, just uh, ten empty boxes. Yeah. Yep. We did the same idea for Pirates Week, and they made pirate ships out of them. Three different teams. Isn't that great? Go take here, play. Yeah, and it's amazing what theater you know will bring out in you. Like I always did children's theater as a kid. Like since I was ten, I would go every summer, and um, I loved that the the theater company that that I was with. They would have us one day working on the sets, one day working on on the music part of it, another day working on lines. Like, you got to see every... Another day we were building things, another day we were painting. I just love that. I love how theater will pull everybody in. That's yeah, right. Like, next week, next week we're doing a music video, so I'm turning camp into uh, a, a video set. Craft service, breaks, they get to do all of that. You know, I, I love it so helpful for if you you know do go into this industry and because like i've been on sets where you know it's crazy and i'm like oh, give me the mic i can do it myself i can mic myself you know i've worked <laughs> every freaking aspect of theater to such a degree that like i feel so comfortable and i also just respect and appreciate the work and the effort that goes into every cast and crew member especially crew Yes, especially crew. I agree. They don't realize how much work, how much work it is, you know, yeah. and dealing with all the personalities and making sure everything is good. And, and I think really running our company is what that, you know, we try to encapsulate that and really understand, even if we're not doing it ourselves, that that how it works and all the working parts and how to make that's it That's why it's together. important. That's why we consider ourselves Renaissance artists and why we think it's important to be a Renaissance artist, right? Because in the Renaissance, everyone did everything, right? You weren't just a thing. You had your hands in all, all of the places. So there's an appreciation and a respect that comes into play, you know, when if you've never done the spotlight before, if you're only active, but now all of a sudden you're in charge of the lights or your stage manager. Or you've never drilled a yeah. hole through your finger when you're trying to build a, yeah. put a caster on, yeah. on, a, on a couch. Like, I always tell people college theater, if you've gone to college and you take that, it's so educational because you learn, you learn how to put on a show. You just don't learn how to act. You just don't learn how to, you learn how to put on a show all the way through. And then you have to take your finals and do everybody's one acts at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just like being in New York. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we there, we could talk for hours about this, and you you are both wonderful. Thank you for joining us tonight. Please, I, I can't say enough about Emily DeNova, Gregory Chaffee, and G and E Productions. Go to their website because it's actually an amazing website, and click on every single film or piece that they work on, and and watch it. The trailers are great and interesting and the, uh, as i said the cinematography is really high end and i uh, just very interesting i loved it now i'm going to go to the blog part of it and we'll send you some films too um okay. we can't release publicly because they're on the festival circuit and stuff but we can send you guys some stuff for sure. okay thank you so much and i hope you'll come back on and as i said if you have something new coming up 
just send it to me and I will put it on my show page. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Guys, thank we really you both. You're it. wonderful. And Leo, you know I love you. Can't thank you enough. I want to thank Jim Bell. He's our producer and engineer at Arms Radio. This will be in podcast in, in about 6 to 12 hours on Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Do not forget to register to vote. Do not forget to vote in the primaries. In New York, I know it's August 23rd. Massachusetts, it's the first week in September. Wherever your state is, NBC. What, Leo, what is that thing that NBC... It is you, yeah. NBCnews.com specials plan dash your dash vote dash 2022 dash election. You, if you do not do vote, it. you do not have a voice. So we'll end There's with that. Also Thank you, Emily and Greg and Leo. What would I do without you? Mwah. I shout out to think. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye. Good night. Good 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 night. night. Hey, I'm going to bed hungry tonight. I wonder why. No. <laughs> Who I am, who I am.